tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hey there, friends. I'll spare you all the platitudes about this being your year. Happy this and that and whatever else, okay? All that's over now. A weekend and you've already blown all your New Year's resolutions, haven't you? I know I have. We're back to square one, friends. <laughs> this kid. He insisted on staying up till midnight on New Year's Eve and he's still cranky. He just had to hear Rio. Hope it was worth it. Come on in, friends. Mmm. Oh, that's better. And as prescribed. <sighs> oh, a little of Dick Clark's old cough medicine. So smoke him if you got him and drink those glasses to the bottom. Cause old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. Howdy, you're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu and sign up today. You'll get instant access to the whole kit and caboodle, including millions of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012. Ready to throw your hat in the ring, authors? Send your stories to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, shit, you'll get the full treatment. So tonight we join a group of hikers exploring the West Virginia wilderness, where I understand things get strange from time to time. So without further delay, from author Frederick Pangborn, I give you Where the Ravenous Dwell. Well, here we are, Warner stated as he stopped walking, stationing himself at the top of the hill. The three of us trailing slightly behind him eventually made our way to where he stood. We'll lay it down here in one of these houses for tonight. Finish up in the morning. Kevin Martin and I had now managed to move up alongside Werner and looked down the opposite side of the hill to where he was gesturing to. The hill gradually sloped away from the dense woods we had traveled through the past three days and opened to a cul-de-sac street with houses lined on either side. I was preparing to comment on the sudden appearance of a neighborhood this far out in the middle of the wilderness until I saw the homes in better detail. The houses were older two-storied structures that, after being closely surveyed, I saw their abnormalities. All the homes were deteriorating and boarded up. Sheets of plywood and wood planks were nailed across the windows and doors. Their neglected lawns were of tall, unkept grass and overrun with weeds. It appeared from where we stood to be nothing more than an abandoned ghost town, or at least a street from one. It was Kevin who spoke first. What the hell is this? It used to be part of the town of Merriam at one time, Werner said. About eight or ten years ago, the Department of Interior came in and took this land from these people. The Department of Interior? Can they do that? I questioned. They can and they did. Werner continued. Most of the land we hiked through these last few days is government property. The National Park Service was planning on establishing expansion of some type of state park or something. And those houses you're looking at just happened to be on the edge of that park. Well, they didn't want these old-looking houses being anywhere near a recreation area where the public could see them. They called them an eyesore, an embarrassment. So the government came in and acquired all this land by eminent domain. They just came in and took it? asked Martin. In a sense, yeah. You see, these homes are on the furthest outskirts of town, probably four or five miles from the next group of homes that are closer to the center of town. The government came in and informed all the residents what they were preparing to do and offered them money to move, or they'd be moved, if they liked it or not. There was no negotiation on the matter, and as you can see, he pointed to the houses below. One way or another, they got everyone out. So if that was the case, Kevin said, why are all these houses still here? 
Why aren't they all bulldozed to the ground? Yeah, why are they all still here? Martin added, adjusting his backpack. The kicker is, after they bought up the land and kicked everyone out, they abandoned the project. You believe that? After all that mess they started with evicting everyone from their houses that had been in their families for decades, they changed their friggin' minds. Property was already there, so it wasn't like the people could come back. Some tried to move back in, but the state police patrolled the street occasionally, and anyone they found, they arrested and had charges put against them. Trespassing, they called it. That's fucked up, Kevin said. Yeah, it is. The government didn't even want to pay to have the houses knocked down afterwards. Just left everything as you see it now. It's eerie looking, I finally said. We stared at the abandoned street for a brief moment in silence, trying to visualize what it may have looked like back before the evictions, and how the unfortunate residents may have reacted once they broke the deplorable news to them. All right, then. Now you all know, Werner finally said as he made his way down the hill toward the street. Let's get set up inside the house before it gets dark. The three of us nodded in agreement and followed them down. Kevin, Martin, and I, natives of New Jersey, had hired an experienced hiking guide who was familiar with the country in West Virginia, where we decided to embark on a four-day hiking tour through the vast forest there. That's how we came across Werner, who overheard us talking at the local diner in Merriam as we were staying at the hotel there and volunteered his services. Werner was close to 30 years older than our own late twenties and had the classic mountain man appearance, including the rugged features and the long gray and beard. So, with a reliable guide who claimed to have grown up in Merriam and knew the area well, we started out of town on Friday morning and would circle through the surrounding woodlands on a four-day hike that would end with us returning at the opposite end of town sometime on Monday. Following Werner, we were soon off the slope of the hill and making our way through a backyard of the nearest house, which contained a rusted lopsided swing set. The tall grass rose to our knees as we passed through and rounded the house, making our way onto the street out front. From there, looking down the middle of the street, it was as if we were in some type of post-apocalyptic landscape. The decrepit, boarded-up houses and their overgrown lawns, fallen leaves and branches mostly covering the street with strands of weeds growing up through the cracks in the pavement. Pieces of discarded household debris were strewn everywhere. You stay in these houses a lot, asked Martin as he observed the old run-down houses we walked past. There's one house in particular I camp out in when I'm passing through the area and need to hold up for the night, he replied as we walked. I hope you don't make it a habit of staying out here, remarked Kevin. I snickered at the snide remark that Werner seemed to ignore. It was then that something caught my attention in the tall grass near the curb. I wasn't entirely sure, but it looked like a large bone. Even as I continued to walk, my gaze stayed fixed on the object. It almost appeared to be a human leg bone, a femur. I was about to question my unexpected find out loud when Warner spoke. This is it, number 86. We all looked away from whatever sight was picking our interest and watched Warner moving off the street and up the front walk to a white two-storied house of peeling paint. The oddly leaning mailbox post near the street had the faded number 86 painted on the box. Oh, excuse me, Warner. But didn't you just tell us that the state police sometimes patrol around here? I asked, stopping at the curb. Oh, they don't come around here no more. That was back then, he replied as he climbed the porch steps to the house. Oh, I see, I said, shrugging to Kevin and Martin behind Werner's back, making a goofy, bewildered face. They snickered quietly as we left the street and followed up the front walk. The steps creaked under our weight as we ascended the wooden porch, and to our surprise, Werner walked right up to the front door, which had a ragged official abandoned property notice stapled to it, and opened it right up, stepping inside as if he lived there. The three of us looked at each other in surprise. Uh, 
At least it's a minor change of scenery from being in those tents another night, he said, entering the home's living room area and removing his backpack. He pointed to a brick fireplace against one wall. Has a fireplace, too, so we can get a fire going tonight. We stood in the room with our pack still on, looking about, soaking up our new surroundings. The room was still furnished, yet the abandoned furnishings were not in the greatest condition by far. It was as if the former residents had simply just walked out the door once they were told of the evictions and took nothing with them. Dust covered everything, and the spider webs were no stranger to the home either. A sofa and armchair were set near the room's center, strategically placed near the fireplace. Against walls of peeling wallpaper were a few shelves which still held books, picture frames, and knickknacks. A long coffee table which made little sense of its location was placed up against one of the shelving units. That was until we saw it had been moved from the room's center to make place for a stained bare mattress which lay in its place. You sleep on that, Kevin remarked, gesturing to the filthy mattress. Sure, replied Warner, as he set his backpack on the floor and unbuttoned his flannel jacket. I mean, I threw my sleeping bag on top of it. Better than a hard floor, right? Plus, the fireplace is right there. I guess, Kevin said with uncertainty, while we too started removing our backpacks. You boys can set up where you like, but I got the mattress. No argument there, I whispered. Well, y'all make yourselves at home. I'm going out and gather up some wood for a fire. Be back in a few. Werner stated as he moved past us and back out the front door. Can't believe that guy actually sleeps here sometimes, said Kevin as he removed his jacket and searched for a place to hang it that wasn't dirty. Hey, Martin said, pausing from removing his own jacket. What do we do if we gotta use the bathroom? I'm sure the plumbing doesn't work. Martin, if I may be so bold to say, is kind of a whiner and worrier. Honestly, I was surprised he accompanied Kevin and me on this brief excursion. He doesn't get out much and is a bit on the pudgy side. He reminds me in a way of a young Jerry O'Connell in Stand By Me. The same way you've been doing it the last few days, Martin. Come on. It's not one of life's riddles. Go outside, Kevin answered. He was strolling about the room, looking about. I don't know about you gents, but I'm not sleeping on any piece of furniture here. I'm sure they're infested with bugs, I said as I removed the sleeping bag from my pack and dropped it on the cleanest section of floor I could find. You mean you're not going to share that mattress with Warner? Kevin shot back. Martin found the jab most amusing. I looked up and saw that Kevin was carefully making his way up a set of stairs that led to the second floor. Where are you going? I'm going to check out the upstairs, he replied as he began climbing the steps. That's all you, I said and turned to Martin, who, despite hearing my comment on the insect-infested furniture, had slumped into the plush sitting chair. He sighed heavily as he got himself comfortable. You're going to have bugs crawling all over you, Martin, I stated as I rolled out my sleeping bag. He only sighed again, his eyes now closed. I don't care. I could fall asleep right here. I shook my head in disappointment. I could already picture him tomorrow morning braying like some agitated mule about all the bug bites he'll have. After several long seconds, a slight snort came from him as he had already drifted asleep. I shook my head again. It was then that Kevin appeared on the staircase. He looked about and saw that Martin was already fast asleep and snickered. <laughs> hey, Chris, check out what I found. What? Just come up and see. He waved me forward. Groaning, I made my way to my feet and trudged over to the stairs. I followed him up the steps, and as I did, I noticed that though dust had coated each step, much like the rest of the house, there was evidence that someone had been using the stairs on multiple occasions and recently. Accompanying Kevin to the second floor, he quickly guided me down the hall to a bedroom. Besides the simple bedroom furniture, the room was as musty as it was shadowy, and the only window to the room had been boarded up. Streaks of sunlight pierced the spacing between the planks. 
The tarnished brass bed was missing its mattress. Look at this, Kevin said as he pointed to a large heap of assorted clothing stacked in a corner on the floor, then lifted a child's pink winter coat from the top. You called me up here for this? Am I supposed to pick through this or what? I have plenty of clothes at home, Kev. Kevin dropped the coat back on the pile, then moved to a closet and opened the door. What about this then, huh? Inside the closet was a pile of shoes, almost knee-high. All types, boots, sneakers, sandals, men's and women. Okay, that's a little strange, I confessed. That's not all, he said and moved to a tall dresser and opened a couple of the drawers. Look at this shit. I slid up closer to his side and peeked in the drawers. The first drawer contained a multitude of cell phones. All their backs had been opened with their batteries and SIM cards removed. I now directed my attention to the next drawer. Its insides was filled with nothing but wallets and women's purses. What the fuck? Exactly, Kevin proclaimed. What the fuck? This is like serial killer shit, Chris. I'm talking like Jeffrey Dahmer. I was pulling several of the wallets and purses from the drawer and opening them. Neither of them contained any cash or credit cards, pictures, and especially driver's licenses. It's like anything connecting these items to someone has been removed. I muttered as my thoughts drifted back to the peculiar-looking bone I had spotted while walking to the house. I lifted my gaze from the wallets and came upon an old framed photo sitting atop the dresser. I reached out and took it in my hands. It was a faded color photo of two men with their arms draped over the other's shoulder. One was in a military uniform and the other was a younger looking Werner. I handed the picture to Kevin. This is Werner's house. I should have guessed by the way he just casually walked in the front door. We need to get the fuck out of here ASAP. I shushed him with the gesture of my hand and closed the dresser. Keep it down. We can't let him know we know. Hopefully he's still out getting wood. Let's grab Martin and get out of here. Werner said the next group of homes were like, what, four or five miles from here, right? Let's go. Kevin tossed the picture on the pile of clothing and we scurried from the room. It wasn't until we descended the stairs that we found Martin was no longer asleep in the chair. Martin was no longer in the room. Martin! Kevin hissed as he scanned the room. He must have gone out to take a piss. No, I said in a dead tone. He didn't. What do you mean? Kevin turned to me as I stood stupefied, pointing to the chair where Martin had just been seated. The seat was covered in fresh blood. It soaked into the plush material with heavy splashes on the surrounded floor. On the floor, smeared puddles stretched away from the chair and into the next room indicating Martin's body had been dragged away, the heel marks of his hiker boots leaving a distinct trail. All I could do was stare at the unexpected bloodshed unmoving. I had never seen so much blood in my life. Kevin, however, was frantically going through the contents of his backpack. Returning to my side, he brandished a black handgun. The sight caused me to redirect my attention. What the... Did you really think I would go hiking out in the middle of nowhere without this? Kevin said between clenched teeth as he held the gun up. That's how horror movies start. Now let's go find Martin. With Kevin leading the way, we followed the blood trail and crept into the next room, which was a kitchen. The kitchen was as equally dark as the rest of the house, and we found the path of smeared crimson had turned sharply into an open doorway. Kevin stepped toward the door and peered into the darkness beyond it. I realized I had backed away from the door and was up against the kitchen sink. It's a basement, Kevin stated, keeping his distance from the threshold as he gazed down. I can't go down there, I muttered. I can't. Let's go. Are you serious? Stop being a pussy and man up. Martin's down there. I could only shake my head. Though I had no reasonable argument to back up my numbing fear, I knew there was only death beyond that door, and no words in the English language would summon any form of courage from within me. Unbelievable, Kevin said frustratingly as he turned toward me. 
His back was to the basement doorway. At least grab one of the batter lanterns from your pack and I'll... His words stopped abruptly as his face grimaced in pain. From the darkness behind him, Werner's face emerged as he wrapped an arm around Kevin's neck and rapidly thrust the knife he held into Kevin's lower back three more times before finally tossing him to the kitchen's linoleum floor. Kevin landed with a hard thud and moaned. Werner was now stepping from the shadows of the basement. Speckles of blood dotted his face and beard. The front of his shirt was stained red. In his one hand, he clutched a large bowie knife. He approached me in slow, careful steps, and from the cunning look in his eyes and satisfying grin, it was obviously apparent that he knew I would not put up any fight and be easy pickings. To my misfortune, he was absolutely right. I remained frightfully rigid as he stepped closer. I prayed it would be quick. Ah! The room suddenly erupted in an explosive sound as Kevin fired the handgun. A round struck Werner in the back of his thigh, spinning him around. The second shot hit him in the abdomen, doubling him over and causing the knife to fall from his hand. Off balanced, he limped a few steps, then also fell to the floor. I made my way quickly to Kevin. His face was pale and covered in perspiration as he lay curled up in a pool of his own blood. What can I do? I frantically asked. Tie that fucker up, he said between gasping breaths. Take that knife away, too. Standing up, I kicked the knife away from Werner's reach, sending it sliding to the other end of the kitchen. I then grabbed Werner by the collar of his shirt and dragged his balled-up form into the living room. He groaned in pain as I pulled him across the floor. I have some nylon cord in my backpack, Kevin weakly called from the kitchen. Tie him up. We'll make him tell us where Martin is. Where this newly gained composure and fortitude came from, I did not know. Yet I found myself taking charge of the most unexpected and horrifying experience in my life. As instructed, I searched Kevin's pack until I came across a few rolls of the cord. Without hesitation, I unwound it and began securing Werner's ankles. You think this is going to do anything? Werner spat, the stomach wound keeping him bald in the fetal position as I worked on tying his legs. This doesn't change shit. Why the hell did you kill Martin? Why? What the hell did we ever do to you? I cried as I felt my strength waning. Tears were welling up in my eyes as I pictured Martin sleeping peacefully in that bug-filled chair, not knowing what fate was about to deal him. I don't enjoy doing it, but if I don't take care of them, who will, huh? You? I finished securing the knot, then stood up. What the hell are you talking about? He wasn't always like this, you know. It's not his fault he's like this. Werner painfully shifted himself on the floor. That damn war did it to him. I now recalled the picture upstairs. The man in the picture? You know then about my brother? Robert was a good man. My fear was now partially giving way to sheer curiosity. Either Werner was batshit crazy, or there was more to what was going on here. What about your brother? Iraq. That's what happened to him. They did that to him. Damn Arabs got a hold of him. The army said he was a POW. And that they had beaten him. Tortured him. But that wasn't enough. No. That wasn't enough. His voice trailed. I don't understand. <laughs> They changed him. Did something to him. Something evil. They placed the curse on Robert. He was never the same once he came back. Werner continued more calmly. The government gave us all the bad news a week before he came home. Even when I told them he wasn't right and shouldn't be moved. 
they didn't want to hear that. I couldn't see it right away, but his wife and kids knew. They sensed it right from the get-go. I just thought it was from being captured over there. Then he began to change. Not just mentally, but physically. He stopped eating. His skin got sickly pale. And his hair fell out in clumps. He looked more dead than alive. I I saw a bone, a, a human bone, in the street. I blurted out. Werner sighed deeply. Oh, they'll only eat dead meat, and they don't care where it comes from. He's my brother. I couldn't abandon him or his family like the government did to this town. Or the army did to him. I, I don't. What they did to him over there infected his family. They not only cursed him, but it passed to his family too. Turned them all into monsters. A bunch of atrocities living in the basements of these old houses, eating whoever I can bring them. Basements? I repeated quietly and turned toward the kitchen, shamefully forgetting everything that had just happened temporarily. Kevin was gone, and like Martin, all that remained was a blood trail where he had been dragged away to the basement while my back was turned. I had to kill them. Werner explained from behind me. They're pretty much dead now, so all they can eat is the dead. They won't touch anything alive. Ghouls! Those bastards turned them all into ghouls! Just then I saw that Kevin's gun had been left behind and still sat in a puddle of his own blood on the floor. I moved into the kitchen and was preparing to pull it from the blood when a noise came from the basement. I turned slowly and saw what I wish I hadn't. It was crouched on the topmost step into the cellar, a naked emaciated being of pale rubbery skin, more skeleton than flesh. The apparent necrosis to his creature had rendered it hairless with exposed muscle tissue and blister and sores. Its skull-like features was without a nose or ears. Its eyes were tiny red orbs in its sunken sockets. Small canine teeth lined its blackened gums as it salivated. I found myself frozen. It then crept further from the door's threshold. Despite the lack of light, I could now see it in more grotesque detail. Tiny black flies crawled about its face and body, greedily feasting on the decomposed tissue. A horrid stench surrounded the creature that immediately initiated a wave of nausea in my stomach. It was at this point that I noticed a pair of dog tags dangling from a thin stainless steel chain around its gaunt neck. It was Robert. From behind him, Two more pairs of those luminous red eyes appeared over his shoulders. He and his family were preparing to come out. Without conscious effort, my mind overrode its body, and in a fight or flee option, I turned and ran from the kitchen. As I fled through the living room past Werner, he shouted for me to return, but I was already out the door and sprinting off the porch. At that moment, my body felt as though it were in athletic form as I ran with ease past the rows of houses and down the weed-plagued street until I reached its end. At the end of the road, a chain had been drawn across its path, blocking admittance. A sign hung from the chain's center, but I didn't linger to read it as I continued onto a main double-lined road that connected and kept running. I would imagine it was just another government no trespassing warning. The sun had sunk from view and given way to the growing shadows of night when I finally reached the first house I came upon. Its yellow front porch light had beckoned in the distance. I collapsed from exhaustion on its porch before I was discovered.
I appreciate you returning with us, the deputy in the front passenger seat said as he twisted and looked back at me seated in the back of the patrol car. I only nodded. During my statement of what happened at the house, I left out no detail apart from what I witnessed crawling from the basement. I saw no reason to include an insane declaration about flesh-eating monsters. I wasn't entirely sure if what I had seen truly existed at this point. Plus, the mentioning of monsters would have discredited my story immediately. If what you say is true about this guy Werner killing folks up there, then it'll explain a whole hell of a lot, the deputy driving said. There's been quite a few missing persons reporting the county. There was more than quite a few, I said plainly. Once we reached the chained off section of the street, I took notice of the street sign on the corner, DeVault Street. The deputy from the passenger side exited the vehicle and used the key to unlock the chain, allowing the car to pass through. I had thought that the street was eerie enough in the broad daylight, but now, veiled in darkness and with the absence of street lights, it was terrifying. Using the car's mounted searchlight, they identified the 86 on the mailbox and pulled the car up on the lawn facing the front door. The headlight's illumination basked in the front of the house in light. The front door was closed. This is J-13, the station. We just arrived up at the house, preparing to enter. Stand by, the driver said into the vehicle's radio. Now just sit tight, the passenger said as he was exiting the car. We're just going to take a look around. You said he took them into the basement? I again only nodded. Once they were both out of the car, I watched them draw their weapons, remove their flashlights, and climb the porch steps, then cautiously enter the house, leaving the front door opened. Once they had disappeared into the house, I found myself very much alone and scared. I started throwing my gaze back and forth from the windows at my side. Outside the display of the car's exterior lights, the neighborhood was pitch black. It was then that I realized they locked me inside the car. Seated behind the cage and without door or window handles, my fear mounted. I waited for what seemed like an eternity, watching a mist roll in from the surrounding woods and listening to the inaudible banter on the police radio. Suddenly, a series of gunshots rang out from somewhere inside the house, jolting my already highly strung nerves. I pushed myself up against the cage and stared at the open door and front porch. The silence that followed was equally frightening. Without warning, one deputy emerged from the doorway, holding onto the doorframe for support. His uniform shirt was torn in several places and streams of blood trickled from his head and into his face. I gripped the cage tightly, wishing I could intervene and feeling helplessly trapped. The deputy stumbled forward, making his way down the steps when Werner stepped from the house. White, blood-stained strips of bedsheets were wrapped around his injured thigh and waist. He limped behind the deputy and lifted his arm, pointing a handgun at the back of the dazed officer's head. With a pull of the trigger, the front of the man's head exploded, sending pieces of bone, blood, and brain to rain down on the car's hood. The deputy collapsed in a lifeless heap. Werner paused briefly on the porch, exposed in the headlights, before he shielded his eyes and looked at the car. Movement in my peripheral vision caught my attention. I looked to my right and saw that a black silhouette was standing not far from the car. Its red eyes dominated in the darkness. I flinched as Werner fired the gun again and blew out both headlights throwing the scene into blackness, removing the bright deterrent which those cadaverous things detested. With the lights now gone, more shrouded figures scrambled from the house, moving on all four limbs. They were at the dead deputy's body instantly. Before I could back away from the cage, I had been spotted as Werner limped down the steps. He whistled loudly through blood-caked fingers and pointed at me. I see you, boy. You miss us? I turned in my seat and saw that the figure was now directly at the window. 
I could make out the faint glint of the dog tags around its neck. It was Robert. Bring him out, Bobby, yelled Werner as he descended the porch stairs. Robert's infected family members were dragging the dead deputy back into the house. You decided to bring the law up here, boy? Werner shouted angrily as he neared the car. You're fucking with me and my family now. The car door swung open and the thing was reaching in and pulling me harshly from the car. I screamed as my hands found no grip to anchor me and was easily hauled out and tossed on the lawn. Before I could react, Warner fired the gun twice, striking me in my back, knocking the breath out of me. I felt one round pierce my lungs as I laid on my stomach incapacitated in the tall grass. Werner used his foot to roll me over onto my back. I found myself gazing up at the clear night sky and quarter moon. Robert was violently tearing my clothes from me with clawed hands. The stench from his decayed body was overwhelming. From the house I could hear the others returning, scurrying heavily down the porch stairs. I can't believe you had the balls to come back here. You were home free, boy. Now look at you, Werner said as he stepped near me. With my clothing torn to shreds and removed, I laid there naked and dying, my breathing coming in labored painful gasps. I coughed up a spittle of blood and felt it rain on my face. Yeah, you're as good as gone now. Sounds like I hit a lung, Werner commented with assurance. If it makes you feel any better, boy, I'll be right here with you when you die making sure they pick your bones clean. His words were distorted, and my vision blurred and faded as my life continued pouring freely onto the lawn. My last breath had barely escaped my lips when the hideous ghoulish beings, who were once as human as I, began ripping into me, feasting on my dead body with an insatiable hunger. I felt no pain at that point. My final memory of the heavenly clear night sky and its countless array of stars orchestrated with distant sounds of snapping bones and rending flesh. My love a happy ending, don't you? That was Where the Ravenous Dwell by author Frederick Pangborn. A good reminder, New Jersey ain't such a bad place after all, as long as you can afford the property taxes. A little about the author. Horror author Frederick Pangborn presently has five of his own anthologies in publication with a multitude of short stories featured in various magazines and other anthologies. Check out the Reflections in the Abyss anthologies and Nightmares of the Damned on Amazon. Check out the links in the description to grab a couple of his books. You can also find him on both Facebook and Instagram. And hey y'all, don't forget old Drew Blood does audiobooks as well. And I'm working on one right now called The Grave Digger by author Wade Garrett. I've done a few of his other books as well. Go check them out on audible.com. Just do a search for Drew Blood and you'll find them. A little word of warning, though. A few of them can be a little extreme. And don't forget Tijuana Donkey Showdown that just got released by author Adam Howe. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. 
The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Ten bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend. You already blew your resolution, so let's ride it out. I'd like to say hello to a couple more friends of the show. Roberta Bray Ennis, Scotty Green, Maddie Hughes, and Jamie Bumgarner. Thanks for the nice comments, y'all. Keep them coming. They mean a lot to me. So without further ado, Roberta Bray Ennis, Scotty Green, Maddie Ooze, and Jamie Bumgarner. May the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. Don't piss off any Arabs. Their curses are the pits. And until next time, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Good night, y'all.